So Ryan Bell was a pastor for 19 years, most recently at the Hollywood uh, Seventh-day Adventist Church, but he left his post five years ago this month due to theological differences, um, practical differences between his own belief system and the doctrine of the church. While on his journey from belief to doubt, he taught as an adjunct professor on subjects ranging from intercultural communication to bioethics. In January of 2014, he began a year-long journey exploring the limits of theism and the atheist landscape in the United States called Year Without God, uh, which is the subject of his talk today. Currently, he's a researcher, writer, and speaker on the topic of religion and irreligion in America, and he's founder and senior consultant at Life After God, an organization he created to empower people and communities which don't have the benefit of the structure and culture of religion built into the community for decades and generations and, and even millennia in some cases. Uh, but we're still filled with the same type of people who need those type of connections that church gives to, to churchgoers. He received his master's of divinity, uh, master of divinity degree from Andrews University <coughs> in Michigan, and a doctor of ministry and missional leadership from Fuller Theological Seminary in California. Please join me in welcoming Ryan Bell. Hello. 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 Good to see you. Thanks for having me. This is great. Thank you for coming. Thank you so much. Yeah, it's been great. Um, your weather has been really great too. Usually when I'm in Florida, for whatever reason, I've been in Florida a number of times, you know, dozen or more, and it always seems to be in July or August. And, uh, and so I, I'm not the biggest evangelist for Florida, uh, but this is spectacular. Yeah, this is, this is like California weather, so I'm, I'm really delighted. As Dave said, I'm here, uh, I was, I've been here for about five days. This is my last day I'm headed to the airport. After this, um, we've been at UCF for um, all of that time, uh, spending time with our students there, our SSA students who are, many of you probably know them, they've been probably involved in some of the things that you've done, and perhaps you've been involved in some of the things they've done, I hope so. In fact, one of the, one of the outcomes I would love to see from my being here is that that connection would be even stronger, um, and we'll talk about that a little bit later. Um, before that, I was in Houston, visiting some of our students in Houston. Uh, we also had the ACPA conference, which is an annual uh, gathering of college uh, student life personnel. So all over the country, student life, student activities, personnel come together, and there's two major organizations for them, and ACPA is one. We were tabling there, um, and maybe I'll get a chance to say a little bit more about what that's about. And then um, we were at Baylor before that, which is in Waco, Texas. Baylor, as you may know, is a Christian university. Um, they don't allow our SSA to operate on their campus uh, freely, and they don't acknowledge them. They don't give them campus uh, rooms to meet in. They don't help them, give them any opportunity to get their message out through the systems that are available at Baylor. But they are about 30 to 40 students strong anyway, and just meet wherever they can gather in outdoor spaces or common spaces um, at the university. And so super inspiring to meet them. And then before that, we were in Austin, uh, happened to land in Austin for the first day of South by Southwest. Kind of always wanted to go to South by Southwest, and I was there for one day of it and didn't, wasn't there for that at all, um, and met with some of our UT students. It's been spring break, as you may know, so meeting up with our students has been a little uh, less uh, spectacular than I had originally imagined, as many of them are not at school right now. But it's been a great trip. And it's awesome to be able to sort of cap that off here uh, on my way um, back home. So I wanted to talk to you a little bit about my journey from uh, my, my life as a Christian, especially as a pastor, and then to where I am today. How many of you, and I only ask this so that I don't bore you with the first part, how many of you are familiar with Year Without God? Okay, so not that many, so good. I will back up and tell that story then. Um, I, as Dave said, was a pastor for 19 years. I was raised as a Christian. I was, my folks were Methodists when I was born. Very shortly um, after my birth, they had some marital problems, which they seeked to remedy by moving to California to be with my mom's folks who were Seventh-day Adventists. And we, in that process of all of that, became Seventh-day Adventists. I'm old enough to remember my parents' baptism um, in the church when I was about five and uh, really stuck with me, and I was, um, how do I say, I, I always struggle with how to say, I was always a sort of a good kid and a philosophical kid. So I, I, I spent time thinking about these big existential questions um, in a childish way at first, and then, you know, as, as we grow, um, both 
you know, physically and intellectually, um, our questions evolve and we ask better questions and seek better answers. And because I was exposed to religion as the primary way of answering those questions, I, I was always sort of a little theologian and then became a big theologian um, after that. Um, so, you know, I would, and this is sort of a, a, a side trail that we won't go down today, but I would propose that, that theology and philosophy are not super far apart. Um, they're, they're about the same questions. Um, they're seeking um, similar types of, of answers. Theology, of course, um, turns to sacred text and theism as a part of, in, in some cases, the whole answer, and in some cases, part of the answer to those questions. But the impulse is similar. Um, so if I was raised in a secular home, as I'm sure many of you were, I probably would have gone into philosophy or you know, literature or something. So um, what could have been, you know? I, um, so I have lots of letters behind my name that mean not much. Uh, not much use on my resume. Um, I might be able to teach religion at a community college um, because my degree isn't really even in religion. It's in theology. Um, and so it's, it's a little challenging at times. And I, for whatever reason, I always uh, tended to value people more than ideas or theology. And so when I was a, a minister, I, I, you know, I was raised, and how many of you know the Seventh-day Adventist Church? You're in Orlando. You're, you're inundated with it, I'm sure. Florida Hospital, Florida Hospital College. Um, so there's a lot of Adventists in this neighborhood. And so I, um, that was the way I was raised. As you know, very conservative, yay, fundamentalist, maybe not, you know, Roy Moore fundamentalist, but <laughs> nonetheless. So um, I grew up not eating meat, not drinking any caffeine, not being able to go to dances, not being able to do things on Friday nights because Adventists observe the Sabbath the same way that uh, practicing Jews observe the Sabbath from Friday night sundown to Saturday night sundown. I didn't drink or smoke or go with girls who did. Uh, I didn't gamble or play cards or checkers or, you know, we had to have, we had to play Rook, you know, because it was like a Trump game, but it didn't use the other cards, you know, the regular playing cards. It's crazy. We didn't go to movie theaters because that's where Satan is. So that was sort of my, my upbringing, uh, which now I discover is why movies are so fun. Um, but uh, I didn't know that back then. <laughs> Um, when the VCR came out, that was a real problem, you know, because now kids were watching movies at home, and I don't know if Satan followed the movie into the home through the VCR. That was a big yeah. theological question that we couldn't really solve. So I, uh, I grew up in that environment, but when I, when I graduated, I graduated from a very fundamentalist Adventist college and went straight into ministry at 22 years old. I was in suburbs of Philadelphia, three congregations, and uh, preaching twice a Saturday, and very, two of those three, uh, depending on the weekend, and um, very quickly realized that people are messy, and theology, like a lot of philosophy, is kind of neat and tidy, fits in categories, um, and reality and, and the categories never really line up in almost any discipline. So you might have an archetype in literature, but no story fits the archetype exactly, but but there's enough of it that you can kind of see the patterns, right, and notice them. So, you know, people genu genu genuinely believe in God, love God, love, love the work of, of the church, but they've got problems, you know, problems that the church said they ought not to have, and yet, nevertheless, they had them. So what to do, you know, as a fundamentalist? And um, do we just throw them out, um, consign them to hell, um, or say, hey, you know, the best place to struggle with your problems is probably with other people that care about you that have similar problems. And I always tended to go to the latter, you know, I always tended to say, these people aren't perfect, but hey, you know, we'll all be sort of imperfect together and try to figure our stuff out as we go. So that was sort of my MO from the beginning. And as a result of that, I think it allowed me to prioritize people over beliefs, even when I was sort of deep in my faith. What that also allowed me to do was then progress in my theology in a liberal direction. So when it, when it came time for me to have my very first conversation with a gay man, I, um, I was already predisposed to believe him and trust him and think that he was a good person. Um, and I just didn't know anything about what his experience was like. And he had been shunned from his previous church. His dad was one of my senior lay leaders. 
and I couldn't understand why he wouldn't come to church. And he said, well, I'm gay, and that's why I don't go to church. And I said, well, that's ridiculous. Why don't you just come anyway? And he was a great musician, and I said, come, play music. And he didn't want to. I couldn't, I don't know why. <laughs> and uh, so eventually he came by and, you know, never got super involved. Um, but that was sort of my, the beginning of my introduction to that issue and, and group of people who had been traditionally shunned by my church. And over time, again, I'm fast forwarding because there's a lot uh, to cover. I uh, end up in Hollywood, California in 2005. And I, I had been sort of on the outs with my denomination repeatedly. I didn't, I didn't really participate in their sort of big evangelistic efforts, you know, where they put up a big sign and tell everybody to come and listen to six weeks of lectures to indoctrinate them into the church. I just thought that was manipulative and, and somewhat um, counterproductive and unuseful and a waste of money and all the rest. You know, you'd get a scary brochure in your, in your mail, you know, of, of the Twin Towers falling and saying, you know, what's next? Um, and turn to God kind of thing. And I just found that repulsive um, even then. But I was still about the business of growing the church, making my church as, as successful as it could be. Um, so the church didn't like me that much. And I was also involved in social justice issues in my congregation. We were a part of um, campaigns for health care reform back in the Bush administration um, and then into the Obama administration. I was a part of efforts at banking reform after the housing crisis in 2008 to try to change the way banks um, relate to communities. Um, they were, you know, in Los Angeles, I'm sure none of this happened here, but in Los Angeles they were foreclosing on homes and then leaving them abandoned and not paying taxes to the city on those homes, can you believe it? And, and uh, putting people out of their homes and, and there's already a housing crisis in Los Angeles where there's, you know, no affordable housing and, you know, the housing that's being built, the condos that are being built are, you know, at a price that you would need to earn about $120,000 a year to afford uh, a purchase to purchase one of those homes. That's if you have a down payment. So the homes that are being built in the Los Angeles area are people that are, you know, making a lot. And so um, certainly not me and certainly not the people in my congregation. And so we were, you know, working in the city to provide more affordable housing for people. We're working on rent control issues, um, you know, walkable streets, you know, just all kinds of things, quality of life issues in our neighborhood. And that, the church didn't like that, because that wasn't the gospel. You know, the, my church liked it, but the, the denomination didn't like it. Because the gospel is about telling people about Jesus and getting them to come to your church and pay tithe. That's, you know, that's what the gospel's about. It's not about, you know, helping people find housing or sheltering the homeless or, you know, helping people that are on drugs recover, or not, none of that. Um, so, or, or they would be okay with it as long as I was also like baptizing lots of people and making sure they paid tithe. So I was already on the edge and then Proposition 8 came along in 2008, which was, a, you may know, a state level um, uh, legislation that was to change the California Constitution um, uh, to outlaw the marriage of same-sex couples. And it passed and the California Constitution was amended to prevent same-sex couples from getting married in California. Um, led by Mormons primarily and Catholics and other right-wing Christians. And so the fight continued and there was actually an appeal and it's now overturned and it's all, all is back to, to normal. Um, so we're happy for that. But that whole process, the church endorsed Prop 8, my denomination did. I and a handful of other church leaders in the denomination in Southern California around the state of California said no on Prop 8. And of course, um, they didn't like that. Um, the Religious Liberty Department, wrap your head around this. <clears throat> the Religious Liberty Department of the denomination was the one who sent the letter to the pastors saying, encourage your members to vote yes on Prop 8 because this is a violation of our religious liberty. And Right here in Florida, years back in like in the 80s, or no, the 90s, early 90s, there was a case in Hialeah about the Santeria religion sacrificing chickens as a part of their religious ritual. And our attorneys from the Seventh-day Adventist Church defended Hialeah and their right to sacrifice chickens as a part of their religious ritual. The neighbors were complaining that it wasn't zoned for a slaughterhouse. And they were like, well, it's not really a slaughterhouse. You know, it's more of a religion, though. 
we see the similarities. Uh, <laughs> so, so it's, uh, you know, so our, you know, the Seventh-day Adventist lawyers defended Hylia and their right to do that as a part of their religion, yet the same religious liberty department said, oh, no, 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 gay people can't get married. Uh, that would be the end of civilization as we know it. And, of course, that's overturned now, and civilization seems to be, well, <laughs> not for that reason, at least. <laughs> so, um, so I, that is the sort of the, sh the quick version of how I left the church. They eventually said to me, you know, you're not a Seventh-day Adventist pastor anymore. And I said, oh, I, I think I am. You know, my church loves me. I love my church. I love the work we're doing in the community. So I, I like to say I'm the, I was the last one to know that I wasn't a Seventh-day Adventist anymore. <laughs> Um, when I quit, people were like, yes, finally, you know, like saw the light and, but I wasn't an atheist. I was still thinking, you know, I'm a Christian of some kind, a very burned out member of the clergy. I went to Nicaragua for six weeks and studied Spanish and just tried to get away from everything, which was fantastic. I highly recommend Granada if you've never been there. Um, and came back and started looking for a church. And I tried the Catholic church, but it was like super Catholic. I didn't start, I didn't start with the Catholic church. Um, I started actually with the liberal churches in my neighborhood, the Episcopal church. Um, and it was great, it was good, because um, they were all about social justice. They really didn't care what you believed. You know, they didn't, they weren't that big about it. They weren't gonna quiz you about your beliefs. They basically let you be a part of the church and they were more concerned about doing good in the neighborhood. But it was very smells and bells and still felt very religious and and then also very white and very like upper middle class proper, you know? And I was like, ah, eh, it's not my people. Um, and so it felt kind of elitist and I didn't, it didn't vibe with me the right way. So then I thought, well, I know where, the, you know where most of the people of color are in church on the weekends. They're at the Catholic church. So I went to the Catholic church and as I said, it was super Catholic, like Mary and you know, the Pope and you know, I just was like, there's no way. And the Adventists, if you know anything about Adventists, really do not like Catholics. So I, was, I have this sort of inborn bias against Catholics and Pentecostals, um, they were crazy, <laughs> you know? Like, um, so I, I just was without a home, and then I thought, well, maybe I'm spiritual but not religious, like, like all the trendy kids, and, and uh, I thought, well, but I hated those people, you know? I mean, hate them, but I, uh, when I was trying to grow a church, and you can't grow a church with a bunch of spiritual but not religious people, because they don't turn up on Sundays and Saturdays, you know, they don't turn up on the weekends, you can't do anything with them, so. <laughs> Um, and now I felt like maybe I'm one of them, you know, and I thought that was disconcerting. But I never, the problem with that is I never really felt very spiritual either. In fact, when the religious, spiritual but not religious thing came out as a popular meme about folks, I felt like, you know what, I'm religious but not spiritual. That's who I am. Like, I, I like the movements of religion. I like gathering with people. I like the ability of us to act together in the world. I like even some of the rituals, you know, I, I kind of get into that. I can get into that. I go, when I go to Europe and, and South America and Central America, I still visit the churches and see the beautiful architecture. I like it. Uh, the arts and the music even. Um, I have these, uh, Sistine, uh, um, um, these Cistercian monks that come on my random uh, iTunes playlist in my car every now and again. And some people are like, what is that? I'm like, oh, they're just Cistercian monks chanting. It's no big deal. But it's relaxing and so forth. So I liked religion. I just never felt very spiritual. I never felt like, like I prayed and like I was moved by something or I prayed and something happened as a result. I just, I, so I was like, oh, maybe I'm religious but not spiritual, but I don't know if there's anybody like that. And so then when I lost my religion, I was not religious and not spiritual. So I was like, I don't know that that, what is that? Like that's, that's like nothing, right? And, um, so I came to the end of that year, 2013, and I said, you know, I'm just, I was having some Thai curry with a friend of mine in Pasadena, and I had a little book in my hand called Religion for Atheists, and I thought, well, that's, that's me, you know, like, that's the religious but not spiritual thing, right? And, um, I forget the name of the philosopher, he died shortly after I bought the book. Um, I don't think it was my fault, but... <laughs> But um, he, he postulated that there was this space, you know, this sort of religious space, a space for people who were asking questions about the universe and about themselves and about other people that weren't reliant on theistic stories. Um, so I said to my friend, I think I'm going to spend a year, it was December 28th or something like that, and around that time we're all thinking about, what's the next year going to be like? So I thought, well, maybe I'll just spend a year as an atheist. 
And as I said it, I had no idea what I meant. I didn't know any atheists personally. I had no idea people gathered like you are here. I'd never been to one of these. I didn't even know they existed. I didn't know there was an American Atheist Association. I didn't know there was a Freedom From Religion Foundation. I didn't know any of that. And so I wrote my first blog post, and Hemant Mehta found it on Huffington Post, and shared it, and all the rest is history, you know? I was being inundated. I woke up the next morning, and there were like a thousand notifications on my phone. I, I didn't know what happened. On day three, NPR called, and they wanted me to come in. BBC was calling, CNN was calling. I was on Brooke Baldwin's show within, on day like four. Um, um, what's the handsome dude with the silver hair? Anderson Cooper. Um, <laughs> He, uh, he wanted me to come on his show, but then Bridgegate happened, you know, in New Jersey. So, um, so I got bumped for what's-his-face in New Jersey. But, but that was all happening, and I couldn't believe it. I couldn't believe anybody cared that much about a pastor who was going to try atheism. And it was a little bit unique because I, wasn't, I didn't come out and say, I'm an atheist. Um, I said, I don't know what I am. I don't think I'm an atheist, but I'm certainly not a very good Christian either. So what am I? Let's talk about it for a year. This is essentially what I was trying to do, that I was going to hold space for a year to write about and think about and talk about what is, what is atheism and what is post-theism, as I later discovered people defining themselves as post-theists. Um, I discovered there are atheist Christians and atheist Jews and atheist Muslims even, um, people who hold to their traditions of their faith, of their former faith without the faith part. Um, it's a lot of work, you know, I, I haven't found myself inclined to do that. It's, it's a lot of juggling in your mind. But um, So I learned so much during that year and there was probably times during that year that I just wanted to resolve the tension. You know, like when you're listening to a piece of music and there's that discordant chord that kind of hangs for what feels like forever, right? And you just want the, it to resolve and it won't resolve. And so there was that time in my life where I felt like, around mid-year, I think, where I thought, I think I figured this out. I think there's probably not a God. And even if there is, it's kind of up to him now to like let me know. Um, I've done my part and if he's out there and wants me to know about him, then surely he'll tap me on the shoulder or something. Amen. So, uh, yes, <laughs> amen. <clears throat> so I, but I held it on, you know, and Dave Silverman in March wanted me to come out on the American Atheist stage in Salt Lake City. And I was like, no, that felt like he's trying to use me for something. And I was like, no, I'm not going to do that. But he did pay my way. I, I paid for my transportation. He let me in for free. So that was my first atheist experience was the American Atheist Convention. Can you imagine? <laughs> Whew. That was intense. Yeah. <laughs> Shirts like after school Satan and weird stuff like that. I was like... I don't know if these are my people either, you know? Seriously, like I was like, I don't know, this is not my place. I feel overwhelmed by this. I feel like everybody is so certain about their non-belief, almost as certain as these other people are about their belief, and I, don't, I still felt lost, you know? I didn't know Dave's there asserting that everybody has to say atheist agnostic isn't a thing anymore, isn't like not, it's a cop-out. And I was like, well, I, hold on a second. I, I, don't, I literally don't know, you know? Isn't there space for people that literally don't, don't know yet? Maybe it's a short stopover, or maybe it's um, purgatory. Purgatory, <laughs> sure. You see, this is what I get. So uh, yeah, I spent that year, and at the end of the year, I was an atheist. Um, but I had also learned about humanism in that amount of time, um, and secular humanism, which you know, going to fundamentalist college, the secular humanists were the ones. <laughs> that, you know, in the 90s that we were concerned everybody was, they were the ones ruining America, you know, the secular humanists. And now, I mean, the secular humanists are the nice atheists, right? You're like, no, 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 you got this all wrong. The secular humanists are just fine. Um, so, yeah, so I, I, that's kind of where I landed in that year. And then a few months later, I started a podcast called Life After God, because what comes after a year without God is a life, a life after God. A year without God, a life after God. So, um, started a podcast. It's had its uh, fits and starts, but it's going again now. And basically, we, we talk about people's deconversion stories as one major part of what we do. Um, I was really sick after a year of talking about my story. And not even a year, a year and a half, because the first half of 2015 was what I ended up calling my gratitude tour. Like, I went all over the country speaking about my story. Um, and... Yeah, I just really got tired of hearing myself talk about myself. It was really, really challenging. Even now, it's a little challenging. 
um, which is why I make fun of it, just because it's easier to talk about us if it's not so serious. Um, so I started the podcast and we, we work with individuals that are going through faith transition um, and deconversion. We make a distinction between those two things because when we say after God, we, we also mean people who have moved from one type of God to another, like a really angry, vindictive God to a loving God, um, which is a step in the right direction. You know, people who have given up their fundamentalist God who is looking to smite them and send them to hell to a God who basically loves everyone. And you know, and I know, that this God who loves everyone can't really exist because... Right, he kills everyone. So, or he's not doing enough to stop bad things from You know, there's lots of problems with this God who loves everyone, right? We know that. But, but that's, a, that's a, a kind of a turnout on the freeway, you know, of, of life where people can stop for a while and say, what if God loved everyone? You know, which is, in a, which is a Christian heresy, by the way. Universalism is a Christian heresy, which says that everyone will be saved in the end. Um, because that can't be true. Um, so, so that's where a lot of people are, and we're happy to help people go from, from wherever to wherever, right? As long as they're moving in that direction of deconversion. Um, we don't have an agenda for their life. We don't try to prescribe atheism to anyone. Um, I work with a, an LCSW, a clinical uh, therapist that works with me in one-on-one -on -one coaching with individuals. We do webinars. We do group, it's not exactly group therapy, but it's like group sort of discussion around deconversion issues. We just had a podcast, sort of a live podcast slash webinar about forgiveness and the Me Too movement. So one of the things that's come up on, with some of my guests on the show is that what the church does with Me Too is to um, basically say that these perpetrators, mostly men, have been forgiven, right? So there's this sort of get out of jail free card in the church, which is called forgiveness, and basically everything is fine. And the job of the victim is to forgive their, yeah. their perpetrator and not upset the unity of the church. Um, and then the perpetrator asks for God's forgiveness. And of course, we know from the Bible that God forgives if you confess your sins. So he's off the hook for sure. And everything's fine. Um, except that these people continue to go on and, and hurt other people uh, and sometimes in deeply profound ways. So we, start, we had a thing called the dark side of forgiveness. Um, which was lifting up for people how forgiveness can be a real, um, you know, deeply disturbing kind of process for people. So well, we're doing a lot of work like that. Um, I also, um, where, where are we at on time? I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> There's some things like, I just want to prioritize here. So we... 139. 139, okay. So let me, let me talk a little bit about losses and gains through this journey. And then I'll talk a little bit about um, Secular Student Alliance. About 12 minutes. Great, perfect. So, um, and then we'll have time for questions and responses. I don't have answers. <laughs> um, so, um, <coughs> so, I think the first thing you feel, how many of you have deconverted from being fairly religious? Okay, so like maybe half. That's amazing that it's not more than that. Um, so one of the things that maybe you experienced if you deconverted and if you didn't, it's important to understand, is that becoming a non-religious person or an atheist is not all upside, right? There's downside to it as well, especially in the beginning. So on the upside, there's this, for me at least, this immediate feeling of freedom. Um, and both in my thinking and in my, in my body, right? So. Um, I can go and do what I want. I can, you know, I, I started going to museums on the Sabbath, you know, as my church. It was fantastic. Like, these are like humanist churches, you know, and I thought, okay, this is a great place to spend the Sabbath and take in all this amazing um, creation of humans. And, 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 of course, nature is a great place to spend time. I spend too much time behind a computer, so getting out in the world, seeing, seeing uh, especially in Los Angeles, when you have to kind of sometimes find the nature, although it's there, believe me, it's there. Um, so I started doing stuff like that, but the downside is that there's a loss um, of a story. I, I just guess I want to encapsulate it in that way, that in Christianity and in most religions, there's a story that explains, however ineffectively, the ev basically everything, right? It's a story that explains everything. We sometimes call these meta-narratives. 
And meta-narratives are stories, narratives that, that take in all the answers to the big questions. So why is there evil? What is my place in all of this? Uh, what's the purpose of my life? Where do I go when I die? What's a good life? Um, how do I find wholeness as a person? What are relationships supposed to be like? And how do I find them and engage in them? So all of these big existential questions are answered by these stories. And so Christianity has a story that you came from God and that you're returning to God and that God is going to make all things right in the end. And this is the good version of the story. There's a bad versions of the story as well. But, but the best telling of the Christian story that I could give is that God created a perfect world. Human beings screwed it all up and God's going to fix it and make it better again. And in the end, we're going to share in that perfection together. There's not going to be any more crying, no more sorrow, no more brokenness. We're all going to be together in the best possible Imagine, imagination of a human community. And that our place in this is to do our part now to do the things that we anticipate will be true one day, that the arc of the universe bends towards justice because that's God's plan. God is taking us on a journey towards wholeness and, and perfection and healing, right? Uh, the Jews have an expression, tikkun olam, which means to heal the world. So, I mean, this is the, this is the Jewish narrative as well, that God is using us in the world to heal the world which is why you see Christians doing so much healing work in the world, right? <laughs> so uh, they, uh, so this, is, this, is a, this is a great story. This is a story that you can latch on to. It's something you can invest your life in. As a Christian, you're doing the most important thing in the world. As a pastor especially, you're doing the most important work in the world. You're helping people be a part of this big story and where it's all going. And you might just be a little piece of the story, but you're a piece of a big story. So when you come out of that story, the thing that hits me is, maybe the arc of the universe doesn't bend toward justice. Maybe this isn't going to get better. Maybe it's going to get worse. It kind of all depends on how we handle things. Um, maybe love doesn't win. You know, maybe hate wins. It kind of depends on whether we stand up to hate and make it stop. Um, you know, maybe... Um, climate change gets us in the end and there's no answer to that. You know what I mean? These, these are sort of some of the very dark realizations that when you step out of that story, you're, you know, you're faced with. Also the loss of a, a sense of community, a group of people that are on the same page marching together towards this goal. Um, so, so those are some losses and we, so, and I, you know, I just was looking and, and I, I do quite a bit of reading and psychologists more and more are saying that people don't change their mind about things because they have new facts. Um, I'm sure that you realize this just from your own experience, um, whether it's politics or religion. Um, as a family member or a close friend who you think, oh my goodness, I know this person who, who's an immigrant who's working two jobs and paying, paying taxes and, and paying their sales tax and paying their rent on time and raising their kids and they can't afford health care but they're trying to figure it out and, and this story of this friend of mine will change my dad's view of immigration and immigrants. I'm sure of it because here's this person that, so you show them this facts and show them this information and sure enough, they don't change their mind at all about it, right? It's just, they're just, you know, invaders or whatever. So. Um, or, 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 you know, you have this information about evolution, like you're reading this science book and you run across this story that just, like, completely convinced you that this is, the, this is the silver bullet that will explain to everybody why science is the best explanation for how we all got here. And you share it with your Christian friend in the hopes that maybe this information will change their mind, and it doesn't change anything. Because they have a story about the universe and about everything, and if you take that thing out, the whole story doesn't work anymore. And they're committed to the story no matter what the facts are that you give them. And so what we really need is to, a different story about what is happening here with us and the universe and the world. And um, how, how we go about telling a different and better story is still an open question and something that I think a lot of us are, are working on in our own different ways. Um, it's not as triumphant of a story, you know? And so it has that downside. Um, and it doesn't have as many villains, you know? It's like a good story needs a good villain, right? A guy that you can, you can place all the evil qualities in that thing and then go after it. Um, so it's, it's a challenge, but I think what we're trying to do with Life After God is tell a different story. You know, tell a story that is uh, really about human flourishing, 
about human responsibility and our responsibility for one another, the importance of human community and um, gatherings like this, um, and how we empower one another and care for one another. A lot of the political discourse these days, and maybe political discourse at, in all days, is, is really about what we can get away with, like what we can do without getting arrested, basically. Um, and, and I really think we should be talking about what's good and what's useful. Um, you know, obviously we need free speech, but I would rather talk about what's good speech, like what's helpful speech, what's speech that will motivate people in a good direction and help, help you know, fulfill their dreams. Um, not just the, the most slanderous thing I can say and get away with it without being arrested, you know. And, um, but it just seems like we have so much of that from all sides that's uh, toxic and painful. Um, I work with students every day. I was just at UCF. We spent four days there. I don't really get to go to very many schools and spend four days or even one day. Um, but we made a special exception because what T's doing at UCF is really important to us. Um, and I think is, is should be important to more people. And um, so that's why we came here to learn from what she's doing and um, kind of talk to the students and find out what's going on uh, in their leadership and what's going on outside of California. You know, one of the disadvantages maybe of moving the office to California is that we sort of live in one of the most progressive parts of the country. And when I hear about, you know, Florida's solution to all the problems in schools is to put God bless America on the wall. We kind of roll our eyes in California. You probably roll your eyes too, but it's just when you're here and hear people talk about it, you're like, oh yeah, that was here. Just like a few weeks ago. Whoa, what would it be like to live in that political reality? Um, and yet people like you live in this political reality and it's a little easy to get separated from it if you're not moving around the country and talking to people. So it's been a real privilege to be here. Um, we are super proud of our um, UCF students. Um, they've done an incredible job building their uh, student club. Uh, they do great stuff from service to just hanging, hanging out and having fun and building good relationships to um, standing up against uh, various types of inequality. Um, they face a daily onslaught of like verbal and you know hatred you know from these folks that come onto campus and spout their hate from the public areas of campus whether it's about abortion or about religion or about whatever else they want to shout from their megaphones and, and they're standing there as an example and a light for reason and secularism and, and love, really. So <clears throat> I hope you'll give them your, your support, um, find out what they're doing. There's some stuff in the back they gave me. One of them, the tall uh, brochure that looks like this is sort of a, a generic uh, SSA uh, brochure that we give out to all of our campuses. <laughs> Yeah, this is one of the favorites. The best damned group on campus. Um, we have one that says, um, doubts about your faith, join the club. Uh, because we really want to help students reach out to those that are not yet atheists or not yet convinced of anything. They're just nuns, right? And we know from the last Pew study that 36% of college-age students are unaffiliated with any religion. That's one-third. <clears throat> so, as T explained to us, on the UCF campus, that amounts to like 26,000 students, if the, if the percentages translate. Um, it's a slightly more religious part of the country, so maybe it's a little less. Let's say it's 20,000. You know, like even if it's 20, that's a lot of students. That's a small city of students who are non-religious. It doesn't mean they're atheists though. It means they're somewhere along the journey that I took in my year without God where they're, they don't feel comfortable with their parents' religion. They haven't taken the time to explore religion in the way that many of you have. They're super uncomfortable perhaps or maybe a little uncomfortable with the notion of atheist because they haven't met one and talked to one and found out that it's not you know dangerous and scary and awful. Um, they're just in that no person's land in the middle between faith and no faith. And if, if we don't find them and share with them the good news of freedom from religion, um, they will go back to their faith because they have what my friend Greta Vosper calls the off-label benefits of religion, uh, which is the community and the fellowship and the food and the you know, so social support system that exists in churches. Um, so 
so we talked a lot about how do we find these young people. And so anyway, we, we want to not only reach out to those who find this funny, um, right? Because there's a certain group of students that will find this funny and say, oh, I want to be part of that. That sounds cool. Um, <laughs> others will see this and go, I'm not going anywhere near that, right? I may not go to church anymore, but I'm not ready to be damned just yet. <laughs> um, and then so some, so some of our brochures say, you know, questions about your faith, join the club. We're a club that explores questions of faith. And almost all of our clubs engage with the Christian clubs on campus, have debates, discussions. One of our clubs at Texas A&M um, had Brother Jed, that street or that yeah. school preacher, that soapbox preacher that goes to campuses. And they, they had the insight to, to not just protest him, but say, you know, would you come and meet with our secular students? And he said, of course. So he came, a little room about this size, about this full of students, and he gave his spiel. And the condition was that they got to ask him questions at the end. And they just peppered him with all these amazing questions. And their cl club grew by like 10, 10 students that night. Because the, the students were like, wow, there's a club that does that? Like, we had no idea that there were people that were challenging this kind of bullshit that this guy's talking about. Um, and his story of Christianity isn't like the nice one that I just told. It's the, the one where, you know, most people burn in hell. Um, it's only a re relative few that make it in the end. And people oddly just like him. Um, <clears throat> So this is the brochure that's specifically University of Central Florida. It's out there in the back. Um, it tells you when their meetings are, which are really for students. So that's not perhaps as, as helpful for you. But maybe you know students. And I heard some of you talk about high school students. We do high school chapters as well. So if you have high school students, college students in your immediate or extended family that are in this place of rejecting religion, um, they don't have to be David Silverman level atheists. Um, but but they can just be willing to gather together with some other students that want to explore these, these questions. We would, we would be delighted to help them start a chapter. We'll help. Yeah, yeah. And the, the, I, that's what I love about these sort of neighborhood atheist groups because they do provide so much support. Um, you have real jobs, hopefully, most of you. <laughs> Actually, I take that back. Who knows you know, anymore whether anybody has a job. But, um, but perhaps there's ways that you can help them in tangible ways as well. So, um, so yeah, that's, that's basically kind of what I wanted to share with you, is my journey and kind of how it's brought me. In between that and being at SSA, I worked at a homeless services agency. I attended bar for two years, um, managed a bar, same bar at a brewery. Love craft beer. <laughs> can, I, can I share with you the gospel of craft beer? <laughs> Which one? Yes, yes. If you come to California, hit me up. We'll take you out for beer. Yeah, let's do some questions. Thanks, Ryan. All right. I think you know this is this is not a discussion group. We we have enough people where we can have a good discussion today. Questions and with an upward inflection and a question mark. And they start they start with something that you want to know from the speaker. What, is your, how, what have you found to be the most persuasive of uh, turning a uh, strong theist into a questioning person? Hmm. It's, um, so did you hear what his, his question? Yeah. Um, and to, it's whatever question they have, you know? And, and so I think it's really, for me, been about finding out, asking questions and finding out where the chink in the armor is for them. Um, and you'll find out that some people just aren't being honest. To me, if a person tells you that they believe in their faith and they have no questions about it, um, one of a couple of things is true about that person. Um, one of those things that could be true is that they're just not telling you the truth. Um, so, it, but people will usually say, and, and if you're an, a, a open and welcoming atheist, I think people know that you probably are a safe person to talk to because you don't believe in that stuff anyway. They're not going to go to their pastor because their pastor is just going to try to convince them to hang in there. Mm -hmm. So they might come to you and say, you know, I just, you know, these natural disasters and, you know, hurricanes and pastors are just blaming it on the gays or whoever else and Black Lives Matter and these are the villains and, but I just don't understand how God could allow these, you know, so the problem of evil. Yeah. You know, so that's a really big one for me, the problem of evil. 
So, um, you know, I think it really just depends on where that person's at and the question that they have. I've really found that it's hard to convince a person of really much of anything. Um, what I, so what I try to do is just follow their line of questioning and press into that um, because they're already showing you that that's what they're interested in. The is, half the time, though, you need enmity to do that. Mm. It's somehow, there's got to be a way to do it without getting enmity with, uh, say, your friend. That's right. Yeah, and I think the thing is to be on their side. Like, they're, you know, you're trying to help them and they are asking you for help. I think when, sometimes when we insert ourselves into people's lives without being invited, that's when people get a little defensive. What kind of relationship have, have you have with your family as you've gone through your journey? Yeah, that's a good one. I get that all the time. So pretty good. Um, my kids, because I raised them as good liberal Christians, they really don't have much uh, sort of problems with they're not religious really themselves. Um, my, my mom is sort of spiritual but not religious and um, would love it if I believed in God, but she's okay the fact that I don't. My dad and I are kind of like at a cold war. Like he's not, a, neither of us love to fight about things like that. I see fam, friends of mine and their family and they just go at it and then they like sit down to dinner and laugh and then they go get up from dinner and go at it again. I'm just like, God, it's so great. I wish I had a family like that that fought and then laughed and then fought again and, and then went to bed with a clear mind. Um, but my dad and I just, you know, he gets his news from, from Sean Hannity and, and his religion from his pastor and, and I love him dearly and, and, um, but we don't have a lot to talk about. So, um, and I don't want to fight with him and, cause I don't think it'll do any good. So, yeah. Yeah, um, I have the same question. Thank you. Um, and thanks for coming to talk sure. this Um, you didn't uh, mention uh, your spouse, mm. um, the reaction, or yeah. So, you your yeah, I was married at the time, um, and then, so right shortly after I left the church, our marriage fell apart. We we separated, um, and uh, eventually divorced. And the two were relatively unconnected. Um, my wife supported my struggle with the church throughout my long struggle with the church. Um, I mean, she probably would say yes. Like if you said, are you still a Christian? She would definitely say yes. If, she, if you said, are you still a Seventh-day Adventist? She would probably say yes. If her mother was in the room, she would definitely say yes. Um, so uh, she doesn't go to church. You know, she's a, a hairstylist, a very good one, and works on Saturdays. And so, yeah. Yeah. I'm going to stand up here. Mm -hmm. I'm rather short. <laughs> um, what do I call you, Ryan or former Pastor Bell? Ryan is Ryan. perfect. Okay. Yeah. Ryan, I just <clears throat> want to say how grateful I am for your coming here today to speak to us all. And you're not only informative, but you're very entertaining and and profound as well. Uh, and right now, after your talk here. I feel less lonely in the world at large and particularly in the humanist um, hmm. free thinker community. I kind of prefer the term free thinker myself, but mm -hmm. I'm evolving and consider myself on a journey toward evolving truth like a scientist is. Right. And in the six years or so that I've been coming to the group here and different names, this is the first time that a former Seventh-day Adventist pastor has spoken. And um, I was born and raised a Seventh-day Adventist growing up in Missouri. Mm. Mm. And everything you said about how you were raised, ditto. Yeah. And even... Mo more so, probably, yeah. Yeah, in the Midwest, right. And um, I'm 70. I just turned 70 last September. And um, seriously, I have spent my whole adult life recovering from the Adventist religion and parts of me are still recovering. Mm -hmm. And I feel that no one should have to go through the agony and uh, lose two careers as I did because of the, the constant layers mm. of, quest of questions and disruption to my forward movement in my life. And I literally had to go back in time to um, find emotional parts of me because there was so much that was forbidden, mm. as you were speaking of. Yes, yes. And so I, I feel that I was religiously abused, mm -hmm. and uh, I still, um, 
it, it's just been, um, I, I'm wondering, the question now is to you, um, and, and like you, I searched, I went to all these different religions searching for an sure. alternate home. And eventually I, I just could not stand to look at a cross above a church because it looked grotesque to me and hmm. I would see these images. And I felt that I was being emotionally manipulated. And um, so I questioned a lot. And uh, I'm still questioning and I'm open to evolving truth. So this thing of non-belongingness, yes, when you leave the church, uh, the particular church that we were raised in, it, you lose a whole family, you lose a whole culture, you lose a whole community. And so I'm wondering if you um, still feel, uh, I'm still on a quest to become a whole person because I mm. feel like I was, so much of my wholeness was forbidden to me. Yep. Do you still feel that parts of you are not whole yet mm. and that you're struggling to um, find all your parts? Mm. Great question, and thank you. I know, um, you know, we we favor questions, and, and but I really I'm glad for your story as well because I'm really happy that, to know what you said. Um, yes, um, I I do feel a little unput together, um, and I suppose we all do in different for different reasons, but um, especially. I mean, since I have this job now at SSA for the last six months, I feel a lot more whole. Um, as a pastor, I, that was my identity. It wasn't just a job, you know. And um, so it's been hard to not be about anything, you know, like to not like or, or not to have a, a platform for some cause. Or, you know, I just was like, it's just me in my living room. And YouTube, <laughs> you know, like trying to learn. Yeah, I know all the pod. I know it's there's this virtual community. Um, I do feel um, a little bitter about my education. I, I wish I could do my education over again, um, but we're always learning. And formal education is um, not all it's cracked up to be at times. There's a lot we can learn on our own and in small communities like this one. So, um, and I've. Uh, as I've gotten older, I've found that um, I perhaps was more of an introvert than I realized, that my job sort of required me to be extroverted. And I, I can throw on the extrovert when I need to and be the life of the party if I have to. I also get really worn out by being around people, and I'm happy with the three or four good friends that I have. There was a time in my life that I didn't feel complete unless I had like a posse, you know? <laughs> so um, I, feel, I feel okay. People, uh, you know, I don't have a lot of friends, and I don't mean that in a pathetic sort of way. I mean, I, I, I just, a lot of my friends left me, um, and I don't have a lot of time to make new friends, although uh, my girlfriend and I do have friends that, that we uh, enjoy very much, and that's good enough for me. Like, I'm okay with it. We were talking, Dave and I, on the way over here about gatherings like this, and Sunday Assembly, and Oasis, and um, like you, I... I find the symbols of faith a little triggering, if I can use that word. Um, but I also, um, I also find sometimes gathering in this format a little off-putting, you know? Um, I really like your format, which is very much like, here's what we're doing, here's our speaker, here's what's happening next week, have a great day, go to the restaurant, have good food with each other. Uh, the Sunday Assembly thing, and again, this is not meant to be a blanket criticism of Sunday Assembly. But the whole like get up and sing and have have a happy time and shake each other, you know, like put on that happiness. Man, I facilitated that for 20 years. <laughs> like, okay, now it's time to be happy. Everybody get up and be happy. You know, and I'm just like, oh, I don't know why I'm just so allergic to that kind of like thing. And Amen. I'm so happy that people are doing it. I really am. I don't wanna, I think there are people that it's so important that that is so important in their life. And they should go and they should enjoy it and they should duplicate it everywhere they can. I just find it really hard for me um, because it feels, yeah, yeah, it feels phony. Um, and for some people, it's not phony. They're, that's genuinely who they are. But in church, I would say, okay, turn to the person next to you and, and ha let's pray. Turn to the person and say, and my wife would head for the bathroom, you know, just like, I'm out of here. I'm not praying with some stranger sitting next to me. And, or, or, or the you know, worship leader would say, like, turn around to the person next to you and tell them what you did this, tell them, tell them how the Lord blessed you this week. 
I'm like, I, uh, I'm starting to get itchy, you know? Like, so, so all that stuff is, is hard for me. Um, so I, I don't feel like I have a community. I don't feel like I have a, um, the people that I've engaged with sometimes in, in the atheist and secular community have turned out to be real problematic people too and I'm just like continually disappointed by them the way I was disappointed by religious people that have been a big problem so there's no panacea and there's no there's no like it's not like you step into atheism and the world's better the world's the same shitty place it was before <laughs> and the same beautiful place it was before sorry I'm a little I've been on the road for 10 days no. <laughs> but it's it's there's no guarantees there's no guarantees uh, I, I was curious about the anti-Catholic type thing. Mm. I, I've been asked uh, approached it before by some Seventh-day Adventists, and I tell them I'm an atheist, but I used to be a Catholic, and they could care less than if I was an atheist. They, <laughs> what's the deal with the Catholics and Saint? Yeah, the short version of that, Martin Luther, um, the reformer, uh, was one of the first people to say that the Pope was the Antichrist, and Protestants have loved that line ever since. Um, and you know maybe they got a point. Uh, <laughs> so, um, but but yeah, the the Adventist narrative, the Adventist apocalyptic narrative, really centers um, both religious and secular villains. In fact, in the Adventist apocalyptic narrative, religious people are the bigger of the villains. You guys aren't nearly as much of a threat to them as the Pentecostals, the Sunday worshiping Christians. Those are the people that will collude. Now, now get this, and tell me if this doesn't sound a little bit familiar to you. The Adventist church believes that um, what they would call apostate Protestantism, like Protestants that have gone wrong, will collude with government to enforce their religious beliefs on the world. But the way that it will manifest exactly is in a hege hegemonic kind of Christian belief, which means mandatory Sunday worship on um, pain of death eventually. At first it's on pain of not being able to participate in the economic life of the world, sort of being cut off from the economics, and then eventually they'll kill you if you don't worship on Sunday. Sort of like the Inquisition in, back in the day when you had to swear to be a Catholic and to burn you at the stake if you didn't. So Adventists envision that in the future where um, sort of Christian, what we would now call the Christian right, colludes with the government to create um, a, a authoritarian Christian regime that puts people to death if they don't comply in the end. You get 666 putting the sword in. Right, the number of, yeah, there's all different interpretations of the number of the mark of the beast is a part of that. So Catholics are at the forefront of seeing that that happens. And there was a time during John Paul II's papacy that there was talk about the New World Order. So the New World Order became this global conspiracy to enforce Christianity in the Sunday observing Catholic way on the world. It's a little far-fetched, but you know, the more I think about it, it's not entirely far-fetched, but it's, I mean, I don't think it's gonna play out the way they think it's gonna play out, but that's the story. And that's why Catholics in particular, they also changed the Sabbath from Saturday to Sunday, and that's the other big one. Why do you need a story? Okay, it's a great question. Um, so we, and I'm not an expert, so um, my understanding of, of how my mind works and I think what psychologists are trying to tell us about the way our minds work is that we file information about the world in narratives. So we think in narratives um, and I think, who was the philosopher that talked about paradigms, paradigm shifts? Kuhn, yeah, Thomas Kuhn. So he talked about how if you are confronted with a, a new piece of information, the first thing your mind does is it tries to see if it fits within the paradigm that you have in your mind. So um, if you tell me that um, the sky is green, I, there's no place for that information in my, in my mind because all my experience and everything I've learned and everything tells me that that's not true. Um, so what he says is paradigm shifts happen when there's finally enough information compiled into a, a new picture, a new paradigm, and the new paradigm overwhelms the old one. Um, he was talking more about technological revolutions, but it also, I believe, is true 
in our, our personal belief systems. So what, we, what our brains do is when they, when it's like a vi information is like a virus, it comes in and our body, this, our brain decides, is this useful information or not? And if it threatens the story that makes sense of your life, you just discard it. And which is why people have such an easy time just getting rid of information. Like, and again, I don't want to get into politics here in Central Florida, but do it, do it, do it. you know, when 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 you have an, an electorate, a large section of the electorate, not the majority, as it turns out, but a large section of the electorate, who is impervious to information about the current president, no matter what is revealed about this person, it matters not a bit. Um, because there's a story that they care about, and he's just a part of that story. And Trump is like a disposable piece, right? That can be replaced. Um, but if you replace him at the whims of, of other, like the Democrats, for example, or liberals or leftists, you know, you're giving up the story. And so you can't do that. So you have to, you have to discard the facts in some way so that you make room for this story to continue. Eventually, people see enough information and a new story begins to take shape in their minds that they are able to accept that story and now there's places for that new information to be filed. But it's, you know, it's an evolutionary thing. Like We can't process every little bit of information that comes at us. We have to do stuff with it quickly. Um, so if I, useless data is always coming into my mind, it's like the titles of all these books. Like I can't process the titles of all these books and so my mind just filters them out. And um, although some books have caught my attention, as I've walked through here, because I recognize them and I've seen them before, and you know, my brain says, "Oh, there's an, a, a pattern that it associates with that." So that's a long-winded way of saying I think what, what's happening, what what people think, philosophers and psychologists think is happening, is that we um, form sort of webs of knowledge in our minds, and some information fits and some doesn't, and it's a protection mechanism to keep out certain information. This really follows up on, on the last. I was thinking that um, humans are, are not really that rational. Mm. We, we really feed on community, we feed on emotion, and we feed on story. And religion taps into that very well. Mm. And how important do you think it is for the atheist and humanist movements to tap into that in order to grow the movement? Yeah, I, I think it is important because it's who we are. I, and I think emotions are easily manipulated, and Christians also know how to do that. Yeah. So I think there's an ethical line around emotions that we always have to keep in the forefront of our thinking. But if I, if I make you laugh, you're going to accept what I say more readily. That's not why I make you laugh. I'm just, I'm just up here talking. Um, but but if, if, I, if I, I can win you over in ways that are... If, if I sit up here and drone on and on and tell you things and you're going to, you know, be bored. And so I, I think that their emotions are super important because we are both rational and emotional creatures. And I think we d ignore that to our peril, um, especially as we're trying to convey information. If you convey it with pretty pictures and a YouTube video, a nicely designed infographic, people are like, oh, look at that. And it can also be abused, right? So I think the, the, the rational part of us is guarding against emotionalism. And I think the emotional part of us is hopefully guarding against like this kind of rational, what I call like Vulcan atheists, you know, who, you know, are more rational than you, bro. And and I I just don't, you know, I'm just like, I don't, and they're gonna beat you down with their information. And I'm and that's their right to do that. I, I just don't think they're winning many people over. Maybe they are, you know, maybe they are. They're not winning me over. <laughs> and I think we're different people. I mean, we're dispositionally, we're different. I, you know, and I know people with sort of an engineering mind, and some of you are probably those engineering minds that think through information in a different way than, than I do. I'm, you know, I'm a liberal arts guy. I, give me a poem and, and a song and, and then a compelling story, and I'm right there with you, you know? And I also like the information and the facts, but of course I do, you know? We, we have to base our lives on true things. Um, but I think there's a lot of ways to package that. So as I'm planning the Secular Student Alliance Conference, our theme this year is courage, I'm sorry, it's important the order, curiosity, compassion, and courage. So to me, curiosity is about our minds. You know, it's what drives the scientific pursuit. It's what drives the social scientific pursuit. If I encounter someone who's quite dissimilar to me, my curiosity, hopefully, instead of shunning that person as another, Hopefully my curiosity kicks in and I say, oh, 
who is this person from another part of the world or another part of the country that speaks with an accent and whose hair is different? And I want to get to know them. Like, what, what makes them tick and who are they? The same way as if I run across an animal I've never seen before. I'm curious, what is this? And then compassion hopefully follows quickly behind that curiosity where we're saying, wow, the world is amazing, isn't it? All this diversity, all this wonderful, wonderful people. I love being alive. And then courage to stand up and sort of be represented and, and on behalf of people that often aren't included in the discourse. And to me, that's like the, the strength of the movement. Um, so I think, you know, curiosity and compassion together really, I think, makes for a very powerful sort of presentation of what humanists stand for. And I have a feeling that's time. Two more, okay. I have uh, several elderly friends who are very Christian. Uh, and we are in the cemetery looking at the six-foot hole. Mm. I would not dare try to change their philosophy. Mm. And they know me, and they're not going to change my philosophy. Uh, long live the difference is mm. our philosophy. Mm. I was at a Bible study about a year ago, and this elderly lady said, she hopes that she doesn't live very long now because her husband recently died and, and she wants to be with her husband. My goodness, let, the, let them have their, their, their philosophy and let me have mine. Yeah. yeah, especially at a certain point in someone's life, whether it's towards the end or... Like, I think those stories can be useful, even if untrue, or at least we suspect they're untrue, right? Um, it's a useful story. It's a comforting story, and I agree with you. I, I, my grandmother is in her mid-90s, and she tells me regularly that she's praying for me and that she's sure that Jesus still loves me and that he understands the journey that I've been on and that he's not judging me. And what I hear in that is that she loves me and she doesn't believe I'm going to go to hell no matter what I've said and that she's going to see me again someday. And I'm okay with that, you know? She's 93. For, and I don't have any desire to strip her religion. What good would that possibly do her at this point in her life? If she was 16 and she believed that some of that stuff, I, a different story, you know? If it was harming her life in some demonstrable way, sure, I'm gonna try to reason with her, but I mean, it's a little annoying that she can't accept me for who I am, but what the hell? <laughs> All right, last question. <laughs> Um, I helped a, a Seventh Day Adventist get a workplace accommodation for their schedule. Mm. And Thank you, that's very nice. <laughs> and it occurs to me that, and I hope it's true, that they would support a notion of separation of church and state. Mm. So the question is how do you build an alliance in furtherance of that mm. agenda? I think, it's, I think you actually would find allies in the Adventist church on separation of church and state. Um, they are very strong on that um, because they're Sabbatarians um, and because the dominant religious format is Sunday worship. So as I said before, they're terrified of this eventual future where they'll be forced to worship on Sunday. You know, Jews in, in a similar way are, are very strong on separation because nobody's ever favored them. They've always been on the butt end of the rifle. So, um, so I... Sure. Well, we all should be. Yeah, we should make room for religious diversity because that includes us too. This is America. It's, it was founded on plurality and pluralism is good for everyone. Um, when people's preference starts to impede on other people, then that's where we have to draw the line and that's the separation. So I think you would find, I think this thing with the, the um, Proposition 8 in California was an anomaly because that's so reprehensible to them that they made an exception in a way. They wouldn't admit that, but that's that's kind of, and they made some convoluted argument about how pastors will be required to marry gay people. Um, I've never been required to marry anyone, you know, but that's kind of the way they twisted it in their minds to turn it into a religious liberty argument. But you would find um, uh, support among Adventists generally. And I know Jim. Jim, Jim Coff has actually spoken here. And yeah. yeah so my friend Jim from years back, Adventist pastor, now working in interfaith work, friends of the group here. Um, is would be absolutely a champion of separation. Thank you. Thank you.